Good afternoon. I'm Wendy Chamberlain. I'm president of the Middle East Institute, and I'm here just to welcome you to our temporary headquarters to tell you that uh, in a year we'll be having these FMEP events at our new headquarters that is being built right behind us. Uh, uh, we've got should be finished in April, so we'll have a big launch, and we will welcome you all very warmly back to that as well. But uh, uh, I don't know if you know that the special relationship that we have with the foundation, uh, it's a, sort of our sister organization. Uh, they're with us. We share many events like we share this event. Uh, and I would just like to say how much we appreciate the leadership of Laura Friedman, uh, who's done a terrific job with the Institute, and with, of course, Philip and Kristen, who are good partners and uh, who care about this issue as much as we do and you do. So this is uh, uh, going to be a terrific panel, and uh, I just want you all to uh, know how warmly you are welcomed uh, in our temporary headquarters. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I'm Laura Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I want to thank you all for coming here today. This event, uh, I'm reading the title, Resistance at 70, the Future of the Palestinian National Movement. Um, I don't need to tell all of you this has been a really terrible, terrible week. And this would have been a tough conversation even if it hadn't been such a terrible week. This is the week when Palestinians uh, commemorate the anniversary of the Nakba. The creation of Israel, which was a miracle for some, is a catastrophe for others. And that was what this week commemorates. On top of that, though, this is the 70th anniversary, which is a big number. And on top of that, this has really been just a terrible, painful, tragic week. Um, we had arranged this panel well in advance of the events of this week. Um, and I actually couldn't imagine, given what's going on, a better panel to give an expert and insightful and Palestinian perspective on what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce our speakers very briefly, and then I'm going to sit down, because very rarely in Washington do you hear an entirely authentic Palestinian voice not moderated through the lens of any other perspective, any other voice. I'm very excited that we can provide this platform today and this panel. So I'm going to start in the middle with Nora Arakat. Nora is a human rights attorney and an assistant professor at George Mason University. Her research interests include humanitarian law, refugee law, national security law, and critical race theory. She is a co-founding editor of Dadalia, which you should check out online, and an editorial committee member of the Journal of Palestine Studies, which you should subscribe to. I'm adding those things to her bio. Um, she is the author of Justice for Some, Law as Politics in the Question of Palestine, which is forthcoming in 2019, which you should read. Um, on her left is Khaled Al-Gindi. Khaled is a fellow with the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings. He previously served as an advisor to the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah on permanent status issues with permanent status negotiations with Israel and was a key participant in the Annapolis negotiations throughout 2008. He is the author of a forthcoming book, Blind Spot, America and the Palestinians from Balfour to Obama which you should all buy and read. And to my left, and who is going to start off this panel, is Tarek Bakoni. Tarek is a visiting scholar at Columbia and the author of the book, Hamas Contained, The Rise and Pacification of Palestinian Resistance, which I am currently reading, and you should read. There are downstairs flyers that have a discount code if you do want to buy it, so look for those flyers and pick one up. He is also a visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and a policy member of Ashabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, which you should check out online. I have enormous regard, respect, and humility in face of all three of these voices, and I look forward to what they're going to say, so I'm now going to join you in the audience and let them get started. I will return uh, to moderate the Q&A with the audience. Thank you. Laura, thank you for that introduction, and, and thank you, the Middle East Institute and the Foundation, for uh, 
uh, Melise Peace FMAP for organizing this and for inviting us and for hosting this panel. When I reached out to Lara more than two months ago to put this together, I also couldn't have imagined uh, what uh, circumstance this panel would be taking place in. The, the past week has been a tragic one for the Palestinians in Gaza, and it's been very difficult to make sense of all the horror and all the violence on the ground. And so I'm also very hum humbled and thankful for both uh, Noura and Khaled uh, for joining me today to try to understand what's going on and try to think about how this uh, violence can come to an end in a way that's sustainable. So what I want to do over the next 10 minutes or so is to talk about the research that I've been doing for the past decade. Uh, to try to make sense of this present moment. I think that it's very easy for all of us to get uh, stuck in the cycle of the headlines and in the media. And it's important sometimes to take a step back and to reflect on the historical trajectory and the deeper historical context that has brought us to this date. And in, in doing that, I think we will uh, also be uh, taking stock of this moment in time, which as Lara rightly said, 70 years is a long time. It's a big number. And it's important for us to see what's happening on the ground today within that trajectory, within the past 70 years, seven decades of Palestinian statelessness and struggle for self-determination. So I want to make three interventions which I think are important to understand today and which are selfishly for me as well, central to the book that I've worked on, which is uh, Hamas Contained. In the book, I try to understand Hamas on its own terms. I went into archives, I interviewed Hamas's leadership, uh, both inside the occupied territories and throughout in the, in the Middle East, to try to understand their thinking. And I make several arguments in the book, but I want to bring to the table three today. The first, the first intervention I want to make is that Hamas is part and parcel of the Palestinian nationalist movement. It's very easy to see Hamas as a, a demon, as a terrorist organization that's uh, bloodthirsty and that's seeking Israel's destruction. But that is a very uh, reductionist view of the movement and one which allows us to not see or understand the complexity animating the movement. When I say that Hamas is part and parcel of the Palestinian nationalist movement, I'm thinking about 1987. I'm thinking about 1988. Those two years were transformative for the Palestinian struggle. It was a moment of transition in history where the Palestinian liberation movement transitioned from the PLO, secular nationalism, where the Palestinians were adopting armed struggle to liberate historic Palestine, to Islamic nationalism, where Hamas emerged as a movement that was adopting armed struggle to liberate historic Palestine. In 1988, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the Palestinian National Movement, made a historic concession. It renounced armed struggle and recognized Israel. We are still waiting to see a similar recognition from Israel of the Palestinian right to self-determination. That recognition of Israel in 1988 initiated a split in the Palestinian National Movement. Whereas before, the PLO was a movement that in many ways united the Palestinians around the core of armed struggle for liberation. In 1988, with that concession, Hamas saw an entry point into the Palestinian National Movement. Hamas refused the concession that the PLO made. And instead of accepting the PLO's leadership and going down the path of renouncing armed struggle and adopting negotiations as the path forward, Hamas decided to maintain what it saw as the purity of the national movement. That purity being the Palestinian call to address the injustice that 1948 entailed for them. The Palestinian call uh, to the right of return the Palestinian call to oppose Zionism on their land. And so Hamas emerged in many ways exactly as the PLO, but in an Islamic hue. 
as a movement that maintained what it saw as the struggle for liberation in its purest form. So in that sense, Hamas is not uh, this anomaly to the Palestinian struggle. Hamas is part and parcel of the Palestinian struggle. It is the latest phase of the Palestinian struggle that began in 1988 and that ended this year in 2018. 1988 was a moment of transformation that initiated what ultimately became the Oslo Accords and the so-called peace process. That was signed in 1993, and it lasted for 25 years. It began in 1993 with the Oslo Accords, and it ended in 2018 with the, move, with the Trump administration's move of Jerusalem, uh, of, of the American embassy to Jerusalem. That effectively ended a peace process that was in its death throes for, for the past decade or so. But during that moment, during that period, sorry, of 25 years, there were two liberation projects that were unfolding on the ground. One was under the PLO, was a liberation project that was dedicated to negotiations, it was dedicated to diplomacy, and it was dedicated to an American-led peace process, the belief that if there wasn't armed struggle and there was a recognition of Israel, that there would ultimately be a Palestinian state. Alongside that liberation project was Hamas's liberation project, which was the Islamic form of the PLO's liberation project before it, which is armed struggle for full liberation. Both liberation projects have failed. We are now in a situation where there isn't a Palestinian political leadership that is effectively leading the Palestinian struggle forward. Which brings me to my next point. Israel isn't looking to resolve the Palestinian question. Israel is looking to manage the Palestinian question. Over the course of the past 70 years, certainly, 50 years of the occupation, and 25 years of the peace process, Israel has been in a situation where it is looking to pacify those core demands of Palestinian nationalism that emerged in 1948, at the heart of which is the right of return. With the Palestinian Liberation Organization, we have obviously all uh, lived through the 25 years of the peace process, which was an endless maze of negotiations that went nowhere, and that enabled Israel to entrench its occupation to levels that had never previously been imagined, certainly by the Palestinian leadership. I would hope it, it hadn't been imagined. Um, and what we saw is a Palestinian liberation organization through the PLO get pacified. Over the course of the past 25 years, the broader liberation project of the PLO has become subsumed by the governing project of the Palestinian Authority. Instead of liberation, we have governance. Instead of self-determination, we have a Palestinian Authority that is explicitly complicit with the occupation, that is committed to security coordination, and that is committed to Israel's security over Palestinian rights. The success of Israel's management of the PLO project is the creation of the Palestinian Authority and the pacification of the West Bank. So what about the other liberation project unfolding over that 25-year period? Look at Hamas today. Hamas is a government in the Gaza Strip. Over the past six weeks, we've had a killing spree carried out by Israel's army that's killed 110 unarmed protesters and injured 12,000 people who are, who are marching in the Great March of Return and protesting in a popular struggle. Hamas has not fired a single rocket over this period of time. While we read the news media and we think of Hamas uh, as a, a violent movement that is leading this violent march towards Israel, looking to swarm into Israel, take a step back and think about how strong Hamas's decision was to jump on the bandwagon of popular resistance and suspend armed struggle. There hasn't been a single rocket fire from the Gaza Strip over the past six weeks, despite the death of 110 Palestinians. That's not the Hamas of 1987. That's not the Hamas of 2004. Hamas, as a movement, has been pacified. It has been maybe not ideologically pacified in the way the Palestinian Authority has been, but it's been practically pacified. Over the course of the past 10 years, we've seen cycles of uh, violence uh, whereby Israel would carry out hugely destructive military assaults on the Gaza Strip. 
And after each of those would be a period of ceasefire. The majority of those ceasefires were broken by Israeli incursions. Hamas over the past 10 years has become increasingly effective at policing resistance from the Gaza Strip. And by resistance here, I'm meaning specifically armed struggle. And it has reached a situation where earlier this year, the Trump administration and the Israeli security establishment and European officials have started talking about humanitarian intervention of stabilizing the Gaza Strip, of maintaining the Gaza Strip as an entity under Hamas's control that is able to exist and potentially to survive without being in a humanitarian uh, uh, w in a humanitarian catastrophe, but in a manner that doesn't undermine Israel's security fears. We see a situation whereby Israel has accepted, if not abetted, Hamas's stabilization as the government of the Gaza Strip. And in that sense, Hamas's government, similar to the PLO, has also become pacified. So we have two governing authorities, one in the West Bank and one in the Gaza Strip, stabilizing Palestinian populations under an overarching Israeli occupation that remains unyielding. That's classic divide and rule. That's classic pacification. And that's classic management rather than resolution of the conflict. Instead of addressing the drivers of Palestinian nationalism, those drivers have been marginalized. And a situation has been created that enables Israel to maintain its rule over the Palestinian territories in a way that's relatively cost-free, if not profitable. Which brings me to my final intervention, which is the Gaza Strip specifically. It's very easy for us, if we're looking at media, to think of the Gaza Strip as being under blockade because of Hamas that because Hamas came to power in the Gaza Strip in 2007, there was a response by Israel that would blockade and marginalize the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip has been under various systems of enclosure and isolation since the early 1990s. The Gaza Strip is 1.3% of the land of historic Palestine, but because of various reasons, including the fact that the majority of the inhabitants of the Gaza Strip are refugees who were expelled from their homes in 1948, the Gaza Strip has been a hotbed of resistance. It's been the birthplace of Palestinian leaders, of Palestinian nationalist movements, of Palestinian protests, and it's been a headache for Israel. And Israel has tried to pacify the Gaza Strip in a million and one ways through extrajudicial assassinations, executions, military assaults, occupation, economic integration, disengagement, colonization. Not one of these policies have succeeded in pacifying the Gaza Strip. Hamas is now the perfect alibi to justify, to make it appear as if Israel's blockade of the Gaza Strip is legitimate, that the collective punishment of two million Palestinians is the only way forward uh, because the Gaza Strip is a terrorist haven. But before Gaza being a terrorist haven, Gaza was a fidaiyin's nest under the PLO. Israeli leaders in the 50s talked about the need to liquidate the Gaza Strip because of the resistance emerging from Gaza. Now, under Hamas, they need to blockade the Gaza Strip because of Ham Hamas being a terrorist organization. The policies of separation and isolation have always animated the, the Israeli approach towards the Gaza Strip for a simple reason, demography. Isolating the Gaza Strip and maintaining it as a separate entity on the side of Israel is a way to enable Israel to maintain its annexation of the West Bank without jeopardizing its Jewish majority status. There are currently more non-Jews than Jews living on the land of historic Palestine. The only way that Israel can maintain itself as a Jewish majority state while it maintains the annexation of the West Bank, which includes East Jerusalem, is by severing the Gaza Strip. And that's indeed the situation we see on the ground today. So I want to end by just giving a couple of thoughts about the protests, about the popular resistance that's happening in the Gaza Strip today. There's a lot of reason to be pessimistic, and I know we've been having with my co-panelists this discussion about pessimism and optimism. I'm extremely optimistic. With in full recognition and, and in, in full mourning of the bloodshed that is happening on the ground now, I see what's happening on the Gaza, in the Gaza Strip today as a moment of recalibration, where the Palestinians are no longer relying on Hamas or Fatah or their leaders to talk about what 
the peace process is leading towards and what negotiations are going to produce. Instead, we see Palestinians going back to the core of their struggle, the right of return, which is a right and a demand for rights that is actually unifying. Instead of talking about checkpoints in the West Bank and residency rights in East Jerusalem and the blockade in Gaza, we're talking about a single right that animates the different parts of the Palestinian people, and that overcomes the fragmentation that has been imposed on them. What we're seeing now in an age of collapse of the political process is a grassroots struggle, is a shift towards rights that is finally dealing with the core issues that Israel has long tried to marginalize, which is that in 1948, there was an injustice, and that injustice cannot be swept aside and addressed through military means. If you look at the headlines over the past week, it's, it's, a, it's an effort to try to understand how Israel can uh, deflect these popular protests, how Israel can perhaps become more moral in the way that it deals with protesters to reduce the number of people being killed. All the discussions are about how Israel militarily can become a more humane occupying force. There is no discussion of how Israel can deal and address the drivers of Palestinian nationalism which are animating these protesters. It's time to have that discussion. And the Palestinians in Gaza are calling for that to be center stage in whatever future phase the next Palestinian stage of liberation will take. Thank you. Thank you, Thought It. I also can't wait to read Thought It's full book, although I had the honor of reading parts of the manuscript, were, which are remarkable. I think, and this fits in with uh, Lara's statement in the beginning of letting Palestinians explain themselves on their own terms rather than be refracted through lenses of national security or through the interests of other stakeholders like Israel primarily in the United States. And so Tariq's intervention is really precedent setting and letting Hamas speak for itself, which is very interesting because uh, mainstream media and policymakers are willing to listen to Hamas only when it fits and completes their circle, but not when it disrupts it. So that when Hamas takes uh, responsibility for 50 of the 60 slain on Monday, all of a sudden everybody wants to listen to Hamas. But when it's been uh, quelling protests, when it's actually out of the picture, when it's actually entering into a unity government, when it actually says, amends its charter and wants to establish a two-state solution, suddenly nobody hears what Hamas is saying and they're irrational marauders again. Um, and, and just to remind us that these are very Islam Islamophobic tropes, these are um, racist tropes of when we actually listen to people speak and when we attempt to speak on their behalf so that they can complete our circle. Um, I also have three points to make. We didn't coordinate this. Um, <clears throat> And I will be commenting, using the comments to also uh, reflect on Thoris' uh, remarkable intervention uh, in this book project. So the first point that I want to make is that right now what we're seeing is a different kind of interest in the question of Palestine, primarily because of the role that Trump and the Trump administration is playing. And it's important here to point out that while this is a worthwhile opportunity to take in order to illuminate what Israel has been doing for seven decades that has become abundantly clear because of a, 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 a Netanyahu-Trump alliance that we should not absolve uh, five decades of disastrous U.S. policymaking on this question. What the Trump administration has done is to consecrate five decades of, 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 of U.S being Israel's primary ally, and uh, basically since the Lyndon B. Johnson administration initiating a simultaneous process that basically spoke in fork tongues. On the one hand, it was a commitment to, well, let me just put it this way. On the one hand, it was a condemnation of Israel's uh, settlement policy as a violation of international law and an obstruction to the peace process. On the other hand, it's been, the, and simultaneously, the provision of unequivocal diplomatic, uh, military, and financial aid that has enabled Israel to pursue its settlement enterprise and to entrench its presence. So when Trump announces 
that it will that the U.S. will move its embassy to Jerusalem. This seems to us, on the face of it, like a rupture because it it is actually an antagonism with that first policy of condemning this process indeed. But if you look at the practice, it's completely in lockstep. And by the time that Trump is consecrating this policy, Jerusalem is all Israel already on the ground in Jerusalem is in pursuit of, it, of an all-out frontal removal policy of Palestinians in order to ethnically cleanse the presence of Palestinian Jerusalemites <coughs> in East Jerusalem to consolidate its hold. So that people are more willing to condemn Trump because of who he is and what he blatantly stands for, but not didn't have similar condemnation for the Obama administration, for example, when it increased military aid to Israel from three, $3 billion a year to $3.8 billion a year. So. I just want to highlight that we shouldn't absolve five decades of policy making and, and take that into account moving forward while still taking advantage of this rupture uh, in, in terms of at least the optics of it and what it means on the ground. Um, the, the, and this means a lot to young Jewish uh, Americans who, because of Israeli policy and U.S. policy have significantly shifted on this question. Uh, polls indicate that since 2010, uh, support amongst young Jewish Americans for Israel has dropped 27 percentage points. That's quite significant. Amongst liberal Democrats, for support for and sympathy for Palestine has increased by three times, threefold. So yes, Let's take advantage of this moment, but let's not do it in a way that's irresponsible and then reverts us to a status quo ante of a liberal establishment that would have done the same thing under the cloak of liberalism. 47% of Hillary Clinton's base are avid pro-Israeli supporters. They might have been able to accomplish the same thing by more effective means than uh, the brute nature that Trump uh, used. So second, my second point is building on this idea of, the, of, of Palestinian responsibility for where we're at, um, and specifically the, the juncture that the Palestinian Authority or the PLO makes in 1988 and more significantly in 1993. Um, thought it re represented or thought it explained that the rift happens in 1993 where we basic, or it was it 88? Was it 88? What did you say? Well, 88, 88 initiated a split. So thought it says that in 88 initiated a split. But I want to adjust that just slightly to say that since 1973, and specifically the October 1973 war, um, which was a military victory for Israel, but a moral victory for Syria and Egypt, that was the moment that the two largest Arab conventional armies made clear that they would no longer present a military threat to Israel. That was the most significant turning point because henceforth it planted the seed of a diplomatic option. And it was a diplomatic option that was initiated by the Soviet Union and the United States that sought to initiate a Middle East peace process. Specifically for the United States, it was a peace process that would have entrenched its hegemony in the Middle East in a way that would diminish Soviet influence. In that framework, this was led by um, uh, by Henry Kissinger, who was uh, uh, the National Security Council advisor at the time, who wanted to initiate uh, bilateral negotiations with each of the Arab states to exclude the Palestinians and bring them in at the end. Simultaneously, the Palestinians who also want to be a part of this uh, process are now trying to moderate this position. And I would say that this is what initiated the split within the Palestinian national movement between who, people who call themselves pragmatists, the pragmatist front, and the rejectionists. The pragmatists sought a diplomatic option since 1973. They have been angling to either establish a Palestinian state as the permanent or interim um, status solution since that time, and the rejectionists that were then not embodied by an Islamist nationalist movement, but by Leninist, Marxist nationalist movements, uh, and primarily led by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, represented the rejectionists. This, this tension that, that basically characterized the Palestinian national movement is resolved in 1988 as a result of a culmination of a number of different vectors that reflected the weakness of the PLO, its isolation in Tunis, 
its disembowelment and removal from Beirut in 1982, a shift in emphasis of new Palestinian leaders who are no longer in the diaspora but are on the ground in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip leading the Intifada. We see the rise of Hamas at the same time in 1987, Gulf money that is now, the patronage is now flowing to Hamas because of Arafat's uh, support. Of, the, of Saddam's invasion and occupation of Kuwait. And all of these different pieces culminate in basically bringing us to the moment of Oslo, where the PLO literally, in the words of um, Edouard Said, capitulate. It is our treaty, it is our Versailles, our treaty in Versailles, because we, the, the Palestinian national movement, at that point, not only enter, accepts Israel wants to negotiate, which is a significant shift, but also surrenders all of its accomplishments from the 1970s, where it had uh, affirmed in international law and in political movements its right to self-determination, its right to use armed force against a foreign alien domination, where it surrenders all international law, all the Security Council resolutions that affirm the illegality of Israel's annexation and presence in East Jerusalem, gone. The only mention of international law, hence that then onwards in the Declaration of Principles, which is Oslo, are a re reference to 242 and 338 in the preambular text. And even then, it's not controlling language. It's language that's placed there that says more or less that 242 and 338 will be satisfied when the, Palest when the PLO and Israel reach an agreement. And that initiates another split. And, uh, and, and puts the Palestinian national movement from 1993 to the present on a track of a politics of acquiescence, of trying to prove to Israel and the United States that it can control its population, that it can, in being a sovereign, actually police the population and protect Israel from Palestinians, and surrendering a politics of resistance that's still necessary for any people that remains subjugated as a matter of law, practice, and policy. Which brings me to my last point which is that if it hasn't been obvious to the audience and people who follow this, and I'm sure you all follow this, but that the sovereignty framework, that what Palestinian freedom and Palestinian self-determination means is statehood, that's the sovereignty framework, that freedom is the equivalent of statehood, that that has become a trap for the Palestinian people. Because in trying to pursue statehood, what the Palestinian National Authority has done has been to surrender politics of resistance, police the Palestinian population, prove that it is eligible to be uh, a sovereign so that we have all the characteristics in our, in our national leadership of an authoritarian regime without a state. The ironies are, are, are really devastating. Um, and that's why you hear, in, when we have discussions about what, what, what's, you know, what do Palestinians want, the conversation constantly goes back to a two-state solution that's long been dead to who speaks for Palestinians when Palestinians have been trying to speak to them for themselves if anybody's willing to listen, right? To a national leadership that has not endorsed boycott and divestment and sanctions as part of this politics of acquiescence. And it's basically trapped us. So that now the Palestinian National Authority is part of the machinery that keeps Palestinians um, subjugated. <clears throat> Moving forward, what does that mean? It means Palestinians are at a critical, critical juncture to be able to decide the future. The BDS movement is excellent in that it has helped disrupt the sovereignty framework, but it is insufficient because the BDS movement is a solidarity movement targeting the international community to, to you know, be you know, in, um, uh, in compliance with its own norms, international norms and human rights law. BDS movement is not a Palestinian national movement. It's not a vision for Palestine. There is no vision. It explicitly declines to take a position on a vision for Palestine because it wants to be a human rights movement that target, targets the international community. It hasn't articulated where Jews fit in the future of Palestine and the new Palestine. There's a lot of work to be done in, uh, in, a, in a movement for decolonization. And I think that while we all may be a bit despondent, you know, look at these two leaderships, what they've, these official leaderships, what they've done, I think that once we crack and get beyond our sovereignty trap, we'll begin to see that there are leaders everywhere. Ahmed Abu Ratima is the young 34-year-old man from Gaza who started, who was part of the beginning of the, of, of the protest in the Gaza Strip. He published an op-ed in the New York Times and in The Nation 
Nobody has mentioned him or brought him on television to speak for himself. Ahed Tamimi has faced off against a soldier, and when they when they uh, convicted her, her last words in that courtroom was, there is no justice under occupation. That is a leader. <clears throat> we have leaders that abound in Kufr Bir'im, in Ikrit, who literally in trying to get back to their lands within Israel have extended electricity back to their demolished villages because of their efforts. We have thought leaders all over the world that are also speaking outside of the sovereignty frame. And so I would encourage us to look away to find hope, to find a leadership that already exists in non-conventional forms, to create platforms for them, to listen to them, and to make space and let them speak for themselves. Thank you. Um, how could I possibly <clears throat> follow up on that? Um, Two excellent presentations. Uh, thank you, Tara and, and Nura, and thank you to Lara and um, uh, Wendy and to uh, uh, FMEP and to the Middle East Institute for, for hosting this event. Um, a lot of what I have to say overlaps with what you've already heard, and so I'll try to, <clears throat> I'll try to be brief, um, but maybe in a slightly different packaging um, than, what, than what we've already heard. Um, I'll start with uh, the, the incident that I think is uh, decisive, um, and, and I think uh, Trump's Jerusalem Declaration is probably analogous to Truman's recognition of Israel, um, to the Balfour Declaration in terms of uh, its significance, and I think it does signify a real demarcation. Um, after the Jerusalem Decla uh, Declaration, um, essentially, we've entered a new phase, both in terms of the quest for Israeli-Palestinian peace and in American-Palestinian relations, um, in two distinct uh, but interrelated ways, and I would say equally strategic ways. Uh, the first, of course, was already been alluded to, is that it marks the formal end of the American-led peace process, the Oslo process, um, however we want to term it, since 1993. Um, it is dead, it's not comatose, it's not on life support, it's dead, it's never coming back. Um, it's been dead for quite some time. Uh, what Trump did essentially was to, you know, whatever cliche you want to use, the last nail in the coffin or the last pile of dirt on the, um, but it is, uh, it is completely exhausted. Um, <clears throat> the, the second way uh, is that it ended, and I would say this is uh, almost uh, of equal importance, is that it ended uh, the PLO's uh, very long-standing American strategy, uh, in that the PLO, as, as Nura already pointed out, has since at least the 1970s, but particularly since the 1980s, uh, adopted a strategy that has been entirely dependent on an American-led peace process based on the belief that only the United States can deliver Israel. Uh, and I think there is some, it's a, it's a legitimate view, the United States as Israel's closest ally. It's not an unreasonable expectation. Um, it has not comported with the facts, with the history, going back even to 1982, uh, well before uh, Oslo. But in any case, the, the, the PLO entered the peace process on the expectation that the United States would eventually convince Israel, either through positive or negative inducements, to end its occupation and to allow the creation of a sovereign Palestinian state. And as we know, that has not happened. Um, and so it's a real crisis. This is a, these are two vacuums that are not easily filled. Um, the PLO leadership is in a bind um, because it has no plan B. It has no alternative to its American diplomatic strategy. Um, and there isn't currently an alternative to an American-led peace process. Um, in there is nothing to fill that diplomatic and political void. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we, we, we see this sort of waning Palestinian uh, leadership. Um, I would argue, and this is something that I um, do at length in, in my book, um, I would argue that the seeds of Oslo actually were planted very early on. We all know the 1995 Jerusalem Embassy Relocation Act um, was adopted at the peak of the Oslo process. Uh, most of the laws uh, 
uh, that the anti-PLO laws that were on the books uh, before Oslo remained on the books, um, new laws were passed to add conditions to aid to the Palestinians, uh, uh, conditioning continued American assistance on Palestinian compliance. There were no parallel laws, for example, uh, conditioning aid to Israel on its compliance because the U.S.-Israel relationship was not dependent on the peace process. Uh, whereas uh, Washington's relationship with the Palestinians existed solely because uh, and was an outgrowth of the peace process. Um, <clears throat> but there were other ways that I think the U.S. contributed uh, to the demise of the Oslo process. The first was eroding the very terms of reference that it helped to establish as the pillars of that peace process. Um, Resolution 242, uh, in particular, the Land for Peace, the 1967 lines, the ending the occupation. Um, the, the, it was Bill Clinton who first muddied the waters uh, on, on all of those. Uh, we don't like settlements, but you can build in the settlement blocks and we'll allow for natural growth. And sure, East Jerusalem, not a problem. Um, so really, the United States was always very ambivalent about um, uh, about its own terms of reference in the peace process, um, and, and 1967 lines uh, in particular. Um, and Bill Clinton was also the first president, not coincidentally, to uh, not to aff affirm uh, UN General Assembly Resolution 194 dealing with the rights of Palestinian refugees. Um, this trend was continued and accelerated under George Bush, uh, the letters of assurances to Prime Minister Sharon, uh, all of which kind of, again, further, further muddied the waters and eroded um, uh, these uh, American terms of reference for the peace process. So by the, time we get to, by the time we get to Barack Obama, the peace process is loaded with contradictions and inequities that it simply doesn't function. It's, it's already paralyzed and dysfunctional, much like the Palestinian leadership itself. It was stagnant. Um, uh, Obama was in a position, I think, to reverse some of these trends, and I think he had the inclination to reassert and reaffirm the original terms of, of reference of the peace process. He took a very uncompromising position rhetorically on settlements. With, there were no loopholes. There were no exceptions. We want a total settlement freeze. Um, but of course, gradually backed down uh, from that, climbed down from that tree when, when he got resistance uh, from the Israeli government and also members of Congress. Um, um, but what uh, Obama ended up doing really is uh, preserving the very lopsided, so not only did, did he do nothing to uh, strengthen the terms of reference, uh, I would say he also didn't do anything to erode them directly, but he did nothing in general um, at a moment when they, they needed to be strengthened in order to be, to be relevant. Um, but the one thing that Obama did do actively uh, that all of his predecessors has done uh, was to preserve the very lopsided power dynamics of the peace process. Um, I think this is something that generally gets short shrift in most Washington analyses about the peace process. People generally look at you know, who accepted which offer at what moment, not realizing that one of the parties um, uh, is as occupying the other, and so has a tremendous amount of leverage uh, over over the other side, uh, as well as uh, a lot of disincentives uh, from uh, from ending its occupation. Um, so we see, for example, that Obama um, uh, was reluctant to apply any pressure on Israel, even on things like Israeli settlements. Never mind excessive use of force. There were two. Uh, serious uh, Gaza wars uh, during uh, Obama's uh, presidency um, was unable to restrain um, Israel's massive uh, disproportionate use of force in those wars. But even on something that is a consensus uh, in Washington in general and, and that was a strongly held view in the administration, like settlements, uh, even the very limited uh, tools that were available to him under U.S. law, like this very symbolic loan guarantees deduction, uh, he declined to make use of. And even George W. Bush had, uh, had invoked it. Um, and so there was real uh, reluctance to, um, to move the needle uh, with regard to the uh, power dynamics. And so what that did is um, that left the, the field wide open for 
uh, Trump, who was not inclined to reverse any of these trends, um, but was inclined, I think, to resolve these contradictions, but did it not by reaffirming the old terms of reference, but by attempting to rewrite the entire rules of the game. And so that's where we are now. We are, um, uh, we are in a post-UN Resolution 242 era. We're probably in a post-two-state solution era. The, the administration won't unequivocally stand by a two-state solution like the last three U.S. presidents have done very clearly. Uh, they will not call for an end to the occupation. It's not even clear that they understand that there is an occupation. Uh, we've seen a lot of equivocation. Uh, we've seen the State Department scrub language from its uh, human rights support um, uh, in very troubling ways, <laughs> deleting the word occupied territories. We know the views of Trump's ambassador to Israel um, are, are, are completely in line with the far right in Israel, which denies the existence of an occupation altogether. Um, and, and, and is a champion of the sort of greater Israel movement. So there, we've moved from ambivalence and ambiguity in U.S. policy to, um, to indifference, uh, indifference toward Palestinian statehood, certainly indifference toward Palestinian rights, um, and indifference toward a, a, a two-state solution. So the old game is over. We don't yet know what uh, the new game um, is going to look like. Um, and the last point I will make is, is dealing with the PLO's lack of strategy, um, having, lost, uh, having lost its, um, its raison d'etre, really, for the last quarter century. Um, the Trump's uh, Jerusalem Declaration was not only bad for it politically, but uh, from a strategic standpoint, it completely pulled the rug out from underneath uh, Mahmoud Abbas's leadership. Um, this at a time when the PLO uh, and the Palestinian National Movement in general is at one of its lowest, if not the lowest, uh, points in its history. The catastrophic conditions in Gaza, which um, Tarek um, uh, discussed and certainly knows better than, uh, than I, um, uh, but also a very severe leadership uh, and legitimacy crisis. There is a vacuum in Palestinian leadership in terms of institutional politics. As Nura said, there are leaders but there is, there is no um, uh, institutional politics uh, happening uh, among Palestinians, and that's necessary. It, you know, you, community leaders um, and, and other types of leadership are crucial, but uh, what we've, Palestinian history has taught us uh, is that bad things happen when you don't have a uh, a credible and functional leadership that is credible not only internally but also uh, on the international scene. And currently, uh, Palestinians do not have that. And I'm sorry to end on a not so optimistic note. microphone in the back. So I'm going to open up to questions. Um, I first want to say I am guessing there's a lot of strong feelings in this room. Um, some who feel very, very, very happy with everything they've heard. Some people who feel very, very unhappy with what they've heard. I would suggest for everyone the key thing is that you're hearing it. And if you're hearing things that make you uncomfortable, um, this is what you need to be listening to. We have all spent far too much time in Washington um, listening to only things that make us comfortable or that we agree with. Um, and on Israel-Palestine, there has been a, uh, how do I say, like a, a barrier to entry into the discourse based on what is considered an acceptable starting point, which is um, irrespective of facts oftentimes, and certainly irrespective of the fact that, that we need to know what's going on. So I would ask people when they ask questions, and these shall be in the form of a question, um, that they keep that in mind. Um, and I will endeavor to not interrupt people, but if you do feel the need to make a very strong statement, yes, I will stop you. So I'm going to start in the back in the yellow. Yes, just because the microphone is right there. And please introduce yourself. This is being live streamed, so you're on the record. Um, thank you. My name is Nizar Farsakh. I'm a colleague of Khaled. We were in the negotiations team together, the Palestinian negotiating team. 
uh, thank you for this panel. I think on the, on the note of possibility, the fact that we finally have a Palestinian panel in DC is a thing. The fact that Noura Ariqat gets to post something on the Washington Post is a big deal. Uh, so w we need to see things in perspective, that w there are new opportunities, right? My question is to you, Tariq, specifically, since you've been engaging Hamas for the last uh, 10 years, what are the possibilities you're seeing forward in the sense that everybody agrees that there's general uh, um, dissatisfaction in the Palestinian state with both Fatah and Hamas, but they don't see the alternative. So are you seeing activity that is more like a, a, a ground movement that's gonna pull the two parties to where they are more representative of what people are feeling? Or do you see any inklings of a third party, uh, a third political actor, the same way that Hamas came up in 1988, maybe something else comes up? Thank you. Do you want to answer or? Yeah. L l let's start with that and as time gets short, I may take these in bunches, but we'll take that one first. Okay. So there's, there's several things to say about that, and, and it's a really good question. So first of all, we need to understand where Hamas is at today. Hamas last year issued a political document which recognized a Palestinian state or, rec or, or indicated Ham Hamas's readiness to accept a Palestinian state on the 1967 borders without recognition of Israel. That declaration by Hamas goes further than any Israeli political party ever, uh, including the Likud, which is in power now, has never accepted the 67 borders. So for Hamas, it has already made significant concessions in terms of its uh, willingness to enter into diplomatic uh, discussions and its willingness to be engaged. When I ask leaders why they've made those concessions, the response is always the same. They're calling Israel's bluff. They know that Israel will never accept the 67 borders, and they're indicating that if there was a, an offer on the table, they would be ready to recalibrate and put forward significant concessions that produces a Palestinian state and a sustainable outcome, but they don't believe that's ever going to happen. Now, this means that there's a movement already in place now within Hamas that has also failed, that recognizes that armed struggle isn't going to lead anywhere, and it's stuck. The, the same trap that Noura talked about in terms of the sovereignty trap that the PLO fell into, Hamas has fallen into now. It's now a government uh, that is committed to uh, sustaining the lives of Palestinians in Gaza in a way that isn't a catastrophe, uh, but that, uh, ult that ultimately means that it has to suspend its armed struggle in order to make sure that the Gaza Strip doesn't get drawn into another uh, military assault by Israel. So Hamas is also a movement that's effectively been pacified and effectively been stuck. Now, to, to, to answer specifically your question about what that means and whether there can be those parties uniting somehow or, re or being part of the recalibration, the Palestinian parties have in many ways uh, gone as far as they can down the reconciliation file. And there are very strong external actors that are preventing any kind of unity. The uh, rupture that happened in 2006 and 2007 ultimately led to the separation of the Gaza Strip from the West Bank wasn't something that was in, uh, a result of a Palestinian domestic clash. There was external intervention militarily, financially, diplomatically that facilitated that domestic clash and that allowed uh, the situation in, in Palestine after a democratic election to devolve into a civil war and result in the separation of Hamas from Fatah. Those same factors are still in place. There is still an effort to isolate Hamas and there's still an effort to prevent unity. You see, Palis uh, you see Israeli leaders today talking about the fact that there can't be uh, any kind of political discussions with Palestinians because Palestinians are divided and there isn't a single leadership. And you see when they do get united and there's a reconciliation deal, Israeli leaders saying, but the Palestinians have chosen a terrorist organization, there, therefore there can be no negotiations. It's a lose-lose. So there is a concerted effort to prevent any kind of unity. So on the one hand, we have a failed political project. On the other hand, we have external intervention that's preventing unity. Uh, in my opinion, I don't see any kind of resuscitation happening from within these political parties. I think that Hamas and Fatah have 
both both suffer a great crisis of legitimacy uh, and are probably unable to lead the next stage of what the Palestinian struggle looks like, which in many ways could be a positive sign that there is a renewal, that there could be the new leaders that uh, Noura is talking about could somehow emerge. But it's also a significant risk, which is to Khalid's point, mm -hmm. because it means that there isn't actually any institutional structure that allows the harnessing of those leaders into a political platform or into a political level. So I already I already think that there is a third way, what you're calling a third way. I think the protests today on the ground in Gaza, the prior protests last summer in Jerusalem, those are a third way. Those are the, 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 the third apolitical uh, mobilization that's happening outside the context of the political parties. But the question is how those can be harnessed. And I don't see either Hamas or Fatah being able or willing, quite frankly, to do that. I don't know if, if Noura or Khaled, you have. All right, so we're going to take a couple this time. I'm looking for some gender balance in the room. So if anybody wants to ask a question, but if you don't, OK, we got one. Let's start here. We're going to run around with the microphone. Thank you. Up front. You may want to stand up so that we can find you. We're going to take three questions. I'm Maureen Shea, and I wanted to ask if you have see differences between what those in Gaza, East Jerusalem, the West Bank feel and see about the present situation and moving forward. Okay, next question, we're gonna come over to this gentleman directly in front of you. That's kind of from the beginning. Peter Kovach. Wait, get the, oh. the Peter Kovach, retired foreign service officer. Uh, a lot of talk before the anticipated Jerusalem announcement among my colleagues who were Arabists was if he just says West Jerusalem, it could be a real victory and like a positive hand grenade thrown into uh, impulsion to go ahead with two state negotiations. Um, Dan Kurtzer said that on NPR the morning before the announcement. Do you agree with that? Thank you. And one more. We're going to come right up front to this gentleman. Come back to you all in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Kurtzig, formerly of the Department of Agriculture, who was in Gaza in 1995 negotiating with Mayor Shawa and improving the economic situation in Gaza. We had a very difficult time, a very interesting discussion. And so my question is economics a little bit. What has Hamas done to improve the economic situation in Gaza? I know you'll say there's a blockade, but I went to the Carney Depot, the Karen Shalom, the hundreds of trucks of food and equipment going to Gaza. Why hasn't the economy improved? Why is there 40, 50, 60 percent unemployment? I know we talk again the blockade. You never mentioned Egypt either. I mean, totally Israel. It's only Egypt. So what is a, a government that gov governs tries to improve, and you talked about sustaining their lives, but their lives are miserable, to say the least. I know that because I know people from Gaza. Uh, so what has Hamas done to improve the lives of these people? There are millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars being pumped into Gaza, I know by Iran, by other governments, but not being used to improve the lives of these people. Thank, Thank you. you. And a very good discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we've got a lot to chew on for the three of you, so let's do a round of answers there, and then we'll come back out to the audience. Where do we start? Um, I guess I'll, maybe I'll, I'll add to the other ones, but I'll just start on the first question. What are the differences between people's needs? So I think you, you, you highlight something really important, which is that Palestinians conceive of themselves as a single nation, regardless of where they live. And what these different junctures have done, the 1967 war specifically, followed by the peace process in 1993, um, what those particular junctures have done have been to entrench legal and geographic fragmentations between Palestinians so that their, one, their national cohesion is undermined, but also that their, their demands uh, to mitigate the harm that they endure uh, become very disparate and are not unanimous. But I think in the sense that, for example, in East Jerusalem, Palestinians are basically asking for, for an ease on administrative laws that are imposed on them. For example, taxes that are Im uh, imposed retroactively on East Jerusalemites so that they can't pay it and have to leave. That becomes a really pressing urgent need to, to protest against, or the removal of Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah, like Rifka Um al-Kurd, whose primary concern is to stay in her home, which becomes a different uh, demand than, for example, Palestinian citizens in Israel, 
who are not able to adjust the status for their spouses who they marry because of the uh, ban on family reunification, uh, for refugees who just want to return. So obviously these legal and geographic fragmentations separate Palestinians from one another and also make their claims very different uh, of what it is required for them to survive and overcome. That said, what we are seeing, what we're seeing in this moment, what thought it has alluded to, um, with, the Mar with the July 2017 prayers, 2,000 Palestinians in Jerusalem refused to enter the um, Haram al-Sharif compound and prayed outside. When we see, um, not we are seeing the Gaza uh, return march or the great march of return in Gaza, but within Israel, in the south of Haifa and Atlit, 20,000 Palestinian citizens of Israel had the same march with the same call. When we see Palestinian refugees who are marching on the borders, when 13 protesters uh, were also shot dead, I think that was 2015, am I getting that date right? Um, we are seeing a unanimous and singular call of Palestinians, not for sovereignty, they are making a singular call for belonging. We can say that this is the right to return, but there is also the right to belong. And when I say overcome a sovereignty trap, it's to be able to say we belong here and have a right to remain here. Not just a right to return, but a right not to be removed. And so that is the singular call. Um, if we did have an institutional leadership that can harness these voices, that would be something that we elevate. But it's also, you know, we might see it. I think that it's always been there and latent. Um, just real quick, I'll, I'll take the West Jerusalem question and then leave the Gaza question to um, Tara. Um, I disagree. I, I, I don't think it would have been enough. I, I think something far more explicit would have been needed uh, beyond simply stating uh, a, that West Jerusalem is the capital of, uh, of Israel. If it had, go, had gone further and, in, and said East Jerusalem, not Abu Dis, not you know, somewhere else, but East Jerusalem uh, would be a capital of a Palestinian, of a sovereign Palestinian state. If Trump had uttered those words, I think the dynamic would have been different. Um, I'm not sure that it would, even that would have been enough to reverse all of the other negative trends, but it would certainly have, um, uh, you know, that would have been throwing a grenade and, and, and something uh, around which the current Palestinian leadership could rally around. But simply, you know, adding more ambiguity, you know, it doesn't preclude the possibility of, you know, you know, that's that's what we've had 25 years of ambiguity while Israel is filling in the blanks on the ground. So to answer the question about economics, whenever I get asked why the Gaza Strip isn't now the Singapore or the Dubai on the Mediterranean, I have I have the same image in my head. I imagine someone who's hands and feet have been shackled and they're thrown out of a ship into the water and asked to swim. That's what the Gaza Strip is today. It's a situation where there has been structurally no way for the economy to exist or grow in any way that can be productive and that can allow Palestinians in Gaza to have a dignified life and to live and to grow. So let me talk a bit about why that is. There have been systems in place that ensure de-development in the Gaza Strip for decades. We're not even talking about 90s and early 2000s. We're talking about 60s, 70s, and 80s. There have been efforts and structural impediments to any kind of growth or development in the Gaza Strip. The infrastructure is depleted, and there hasn't been any kind of uh, ability for the economy to grow. Over the course of the 70s and the 80s, we saw integration between the Gaza Strip and Israel. We saw a lot of Palestinians in Gaza being able to go into Israel and work, and come back with remittances, and come back with livelihood. That was structurally problematic for various reasons. Those laborers were, were only allowed into Israel as long as they were passive, as long as they were uh, not in any way active or seeking rights. They were just menial workers. But at least that meant that there were remittances going into the Gaza Strip. Since the beginning of the 1990s, Israel has stopped those policies. So there are now permits, there are blockades, there are enclosures. 
beginning in the 1990s, Palestinians could no longer go into either the West Bank or Israel. Uh, those are the two biggest markets that the Gaza Strip would produce and export to if it were allowed to function as a, a normal economy. But it's not. Since 2007, with the blockade, the, the, the impediment of the blockade on Gaza's economy cannot be overstated. There were instances where Israel was counting the number of calories going into the Gaza Strip to avoid mass starvation. There is no way to think of the economy in the Gaza Strip operating when it is completely structurally isolated from the world. It's, it's incredulous to think about any economy surviving when it exists in a bubble. So the idea that this is a Palestinian lack of agency or inability is frankly quite insulting because when Palestinians, like any other people, are given opportunities, those opportunities are going to lead to growth and productivity and employment. It's not like the Palestinians in Gaza want to be unemployed. So there is a, a, a really damaging trope when we think about Gaza and we think about Hamas choosing to maintain the lives of Palestinians in Gaza in misery, because that's just a misreading of the situation on the ground. The, the other thing that I would say is Egypt. I always get asked, and yes, Egypt is absolutely part of this blockade, and Egypt's uh, closure of the Rafah border is morally reprehensible and should be condemned and should explicitly be called out. But Egypt isn't an occupying power. Egypt is a bordering state. The Gaza Strip is occupied by Israel. The civilians under uh, occupation in the Gaza Strip, Israel has a responsibility under international law to protect civilians under its <coughs> occupation. Those civilians in the Gaza Strip are Israel's responsibility. They're not Egypt's responsibility. And so in, in, in many ways, uh, the, it, it is fair to focus on the fact that Israel is the predominant reason of, behind the suffering in the Gaza Strip, not to bring Hamas off the hook or Egypt off the hook. Hamas has also uh, enjoyed the benefits of the tunnels disproportionately and enjoyed uh, the financial returns of the tunnels. But the tunnels wouldn't be there if the blockade wasn't there. If Gazans were able to go into the West Bank and were able to export to markets there, there wouldn't be tunnels. So the, it's important to maintain that broader understanding about Gaza's economic isolation. Okay, we're going to do another round of three questions, starting mm -hmm. in the back, the gentleman in the blue blazer. Do you stand up so our microphone can find you right here? Wait, hold on, wait. There you go. Wait, get the microphone. There you go. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Kenneth Audrey. I'm a former uh, Foreign Service officer with uh, experience in some interesting places. And um, I was struck by one of Noura Rakat's remarks, which was that there is a shift going on among younger American Jews in how they support Israel. And what I wanted to suggest or ask is, has there been any thought of starting a dialogue between young Palestinians and those young American Jews so they can perhaps find out if they have something in common, common interests, and mitigate, overcome somewhat, the problem of ethnocentricity, not to use the R word. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to go directly in front to this gentleman right here. If you stand up so we can find you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Inon. I work at the Israeli Embassy. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and being here today. Uh, I'd like to start my question with just uh, two remarks that will lead me to the actual question. The first one is that, um, Mr. Bacconi, when you talked about the recent week um, incidents, um, unfortunately you failed to mention that according to a Hamas official, his name is Salah Bardouil, 50 out of 62 casualties were actually Hamas members, and that means people who try to send um, burning kites towards Israel, um, use explosive devices, etc. Um, just one might find it interesting to, to know. The second um, fact is that in 2005, Israel completely withdrew from Gaza Strip. And that leads me to the question. Um, you said that the 
saying that Hamas is actually responsible for what's happening in Gaza is just an alibi. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that as an Israeli embassy employee, uh, I'm witnessing endless efforts by Israel and the United States and countless other partners to alleviate the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, but the consensus is that there cannot be a direct dialogue with Hamas since <coughs> all these participants acknowledge Hamas as a terrorist organization. And my question is, are there any trends within the um, Palestinian population today to try to fix the historical mistake of choosing Hamas and trying to eliminate Hamas uh, regime in order to enable, again, Israel, the United States, and the other participants uh, to try to solve this crisis. Thank you. And we got one more, the woman on the aisle here. Thank you, back and forth. We'll come back for one more round. Hi, my name is Diane Silber. I uh, just would like to know long term, given the situation where we are now, what Palestinians and what the intellectual Palestinians see as a possible solution and where Israel comes in yeah. on that. Fantastic, thank you. So we've got three big questions and you can arrange yourself and uh, break them up as you choose. Okay. Um, I would love to answer your questions at another time, but I want to make room for my colleagues, but happy to help with, the, with figuring those out. I know it's really confounding and can be troubling and confusing, but it can also be very clear. But I'll let my colleagues do that. Um, let me answer the question about the trends amongst young, Israel, young Jewish, excuse me, Americans. I think for young Jewish Americans, there is a shift also because, one, obviously because um, of two things. What Israel is doing, which is very blatant and is unacceptable to most people of moral conscience. And so young Jewish Americans who see that don't want to have that at any association with it. The second is to see the Trump administration in complete alliance with Netanyahu, which makes it even more obvious, and wanting to be on the right side of history. I think another really important thing to talk about is trauma that new generations of uh, Jews in the United States especially aren't dealing with and so are able to imagine different ways forward and different ways of being able to combat institutionalized Jewish bigotry without having to look to a nationalist project, an exclusivist nationalist project predicated on Palestinian removal in order to combat that bigotry, but to see that it's actually part of the problem. And so this actually expands our imagination of what we can do, and that's why we see a number of dialogue groups that are in the form of co-resistance groups, groups that are committed to freedom for all people, dignity for Jews and Palestinians, and beyond within intersectional frames that see freedom as an interlocking process so that you can see, for example, on college campuses, organizations that will stand up to the white supremacy of the Trump administration that targets Jews with traditional anti-Semitic tropes, right? who are in alliance with Palestinians pushing the universities to divest uh, from, uh, from uh, projects in Israel that are also in alliance with black students pushing for divestment from private prison firms. And so it's that intersectional framework where the most exciting dialogue is already happening. And so again, if we shift a little bit what we're looking for, instead of trying to complete our own circles, we can see that people are already answering our questions and fulfilling that vision, which is tied to your question about the future. So at this point, I want to say that there are, um, for Palestinians seeing the future in this very devastating moment of having to reckon with the failure of Palestinian sovereignty, which is what this is, Palestinians failed. They didn't achieve the state. They didn't get what they wanted. That promise from, from uh, the League of Nations uh, covenant that said peoples will be uh, shepherded to govern themselves, that was promised to all former colonized peoples, Palestinians never got to uh, benefit from that promise. But that failure also has the seed of new things that have not been charted, new futures that have not been charted. 
We don't know what those futures are, but Palestinians, when they say they want to belong, are not saying that Jews can't belong with them. Jews can stay and belong with them in a single state, for example. In a, well, it, not as sovereigns. Maybe it'll be a binational state, but not as sovereigns in a way where this equation has been predicated on Palestinian exclusion and removal, right? But that could be a possibility as long as we, we, we get beyond an insistence that it be an exclusive Jewish state where Palestinians can't belong. Look, if you look at the original document in 1947 on partition in 181, even the original UN partition plan envisioned that neither state would be either fully Jewish or fully Arab, but that you can be a citizen of each state even if you didn't have that religious or ethnic identity. What we have today is a perversion of that original version, that's one. The other thing I wanna say is where Israel is heading us to is a definite future that we can see. It's a future where in order to ensure religious and racial supremacy, it requires a militarized answer. That's why it builds walls. That's why it, that's why it develops weapons that it then exports elsewhere. That's why it actually trains other armies and other police forces on how to suppress uh, civil protests. That's what Israel is exporting to the world. So when Durham, North Carolina passes a city council resolution that cuts off the training of its police forces in Israel, they're basically saying, we don't want this future that Israel is paving for us. For us. We don't know what the alternative future is, but surely it can be better than this. We don't want garrison states. We have to find a way where we actually can all belong. It didn't work. It's, where I, is I, the two-state solution? <laughs> no. <clears throat> I mean, are we, I could answer that, but I think what we were trying to say is that if you look at a map, Israel torpedoed the two-state solution. Israel has torpedoed the two-state so solution. So let me, let me just try to come in here. Is, Israeli political leaders are openly talking about annexation today. So there's no, there's no desire even within the Israeli mainstream establishment on the political side to talk about the two-state solution. So it's sort of a... It's, it's sort of a red herring now. It doesn't, it, it's been torpedoed. It, it, we are in a situation now where we need to start thinking about what kind of outcome can come out that can safeguard the rights of Palestinians and Jews living on that land. But going in, in circles, thinking about how uh, the, the parameters of this envisioned two-state solution in the way that we've been seeing it for the past 25 years can be fine-tuned is an exercise in futility. It's not going to lead to an outcome that safeguards the rights of either people. If I could, uh, I'm going to intervene, which I promise I wouldn't do. Um, the the two-state debate is tough for a lot of us, and I, I still hope for a two-state solution. Um, one thing I do think at this moment that we need to be conscious of is saying to Palestinians, you need to endorse two states or you're not kosher to be part of this discussion. The Israeli government doesn't endorse two states anymore in any serious way. The U.S. government doesn't endorse two states. And all active policies of every group that has power on the ground are moving away from two states. I would personally dream of a day when everyone on this panel will say, yes, it's possible, and yes, maybe it's not perfect, but it'll work. But I'm not going to hold out to Palestinians that they have to, to be kosher, to have a view, adopt a view that everyone in power is actively rejecting and working against. So that's, I'm not saying you are, but I want to, yeah, I, so I want to make sure that that's, yeah, no, I'm not saying that you're saying that. Okay, we have two more big questions, and I actually think we're going to run out of time. So let's, we had two more big questions, including from our colleague at the embassy. The dialogue so let's, question? I kind of did. Oh. I, I think Nora's answer is that it's already <coughs> happening. It's already happening organically and universities and in activist movements across the country. And I'm sure she can talk to you more about that after we finish. All right, so we have two more big questions. You guys want to take them yes, however so you I, like. I'm going to take the question from the gentleman from the embassy. I mean, I couldn't thank you enough. You you brought all the main tropes that I was talking about in <laughs> in my talk exactly to the to the middle of this, uh, this discussion. I actually addressed all the points you raised, but perhaps I wasn't clear enough. So on, on the first point about uh, the, the Molotov cocktails and the, the uh, kites, you know, uh, Noura actually said it very eloquently in her discussion. When Hamas comes out and says, 
uh, we support uh, unarmed struggle. We support popular resistance. We want a Palestinian state on 1967. The Israeli political establishment says Hamas is a terrorist organization. We can't believe anything they say. When Hamas comes out and says 50 out of the 60 are Hamas members, suddenly Hamas is the most credible source of information uh, on anything that's happening in the Gaza Strip. So I think there's, there's a bit of a contradiction here in whether the Israeli political establishment takes Hamas seriously and believe what, believes what Hamas says and when it doesn't. Um, so in terms of uh, a few of the, the, the things you talked about, Yes, uh, Israel did disengage from the Gaza Strip in 2005, uh, but Israel continues to occupy the Gaza Strip. The form of occupation is maybe not direct colonization, uh, but it certainly is occupation. Uh, every international organization anywhere in the world that has any credit to its name still calls it an occupation. Israel controls the population registry in the Gaza Strip. Palestinians born in Gaza do not exist until Israel's population registry acknowledges them. If that isn't de facto control, I don't know what is. Uh, the other thing is Israel controls all forms of entry and exit from the Gaza Strip, and it controls all kinds of movement within the Gaza Strip as well. More than 30% of the Gaza Strip is a buffer zone, where Israel determines where, where Palestinians can go fishing. It determines where Palestinians can go uh, uh, into their agricultural lands and activities. It controls all forms of economic activity, to answer the previous question as well, within the Gaza Strip. So to suggest that the Gaza Strip isn't occupied is just nons nonsensical. It just it doesn't make sense. Um, in terms of the, the, the incident, instances where there were uh, examples of Molotov cocktails and Palestinians trying to breach the fence. There were uh, more than 30,000 protesters at the peak uh, of the protests, and maybe we saw pictures of uh, 10, 15, uh, 20 uh, uh, people with Molotov cocktails that were trying to breach the fence. There were 30,000 protesters <coughs> that were unarmed, the majority of them sitting in fences, uh, yards and yards away from the, the third fence separating the Gaza Strip from Israel. There was not a single instance reported of an Israeli army official being in harm's way because of any of the activities that were happening. And that means that under international law, they had no <coughs> right to use armed ammunition against protesters. And yet they did. 110 were killed. And even if you want to say all 110 were Hamas members, which is a, a, a fake news, 12,000 people were injured. 12,000. Half of the protesters on that, at that peak day. So the, the suggestion that the Palestinians were somehow all Hamas trying to swarm uh, the, the Israel is just not rooted in fact. And it's propaganda. It's talking points that are put forward by Israel's military establishment to justify shooting unarmed protesters who are asking for rights. <laughs> All right, so based on time, I think, Khaled, you're going to get the last word. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, uh, so I, I, just, just to follow up, uh, I, I don't have, you know, Tarek, I think, uh, gave a very clear and complete answer. But, but just, um, just to highlight a couple points, um, under international law, one's political affiliation or ideological views are not a basis for, uh, they're, they're, you're not a combatant because you, you uh, sympathize or voted for or are a member of a particular group. Um, this is, uh, I think, a very dangerous uh, line of thinking um, and one that I know Israel has employed in terms of conflating both two million Palestinians in Gaza with Hamas and therefore justifying the collective punishment of all those Palestinians, um, but also conflating Hamas with terrorists. Um, a, a civil servant uh, who works under Hamas or a police officer or a secretary um, or an ambulance driver who is a member of Hamas, these are not legitimate targets under any interpretation of international law anywhere. So even if we assume that all uh, of, of the protesters uh, were uh, members of Hamas, if they're unarmed, they're not combatants, they're not legal targets. Um, and so the responsibility for their deaths lies solely on, on those pulling the trigger. Um, in terms of the, the Israeli withdrawal, I think Tariq made the, the point excellently. 
Um, and even if you don't accept that Gaza is, from a legal standpoint, uh, still occupied, which is not the consensus view of the international legal community and not the view of the United Nations, uh, it is still occupied. The reality is, if we just apply our logic, forget about the law, the reality is that Israel controls life in Gaza to a degree unlike any other party. Controls the population registry, controls movement in and out. It bans not only imports, but exports out of Gaza. These are Israeli decisions. It is an Israeli naval blockade that is being enforced on the waters of Gaza. It's not an Egyptian naval blockade. It's not a, a, a Swiss naval blockade. Um, so what Israel has done in Gaza, <clears throat> and I think what the plan is for the West Bank, and really what its interpretation of, of Oslo has been, is that you relinquish responsibility for these areas and for the people who live in it without relinquishing control, and you can't have it both ways. Um, sovereignty is responsibility and control. You cannot give up uh, control and main, you cannot give up responsibility and maintain control. Um, that is that is a different type of reality, and it's not uh, an end to occupation, and it's certainly not sovereignty. All right, so we are out of town, so we're gonna we're gonna end on time here. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the Middle East Institute for hosting. I want to thank all the people for the very excellent questions, and I most want to thank our three panelists. I hope that we can have many more conversations like this, and I hope we can hear all the voices that need to be heard now and looking towards the future. So thank you very much and thank you. Thank you guys. I'm Nancy Cunningham. That was so inspiring.